We're here working on the Rapasaurus Rex challenge. So Rapasaurus Rex was a challenge from Plaid CTF 2013, so it's a pretty old challenge. Uh, there is a huge, gigantic hint in the name, Rop, so this should set you on the right path. Uh, in the original challenge, we have a binary, and we have the copy of libc. Um, in this image, we have a copy of the Docker image. So basically, we have a Docker container that if you pull, uh, if you run this command, it will pull it down if you don't have it, and it will run the Docker image, and we can see that it's listening on port 31337, so that if we uh, netcat a localhost 31337, what do I do? Just type in, yeah. It says win. Clearly, I didn't win because I need to get a flag. And if I read this whole thing, see that the flag is located at slash challenge slash flag. Um, yeah. Super interesting thing here. Apparently, the current version of Docker by default uses setconf to restrict the system calls that the binary can actually use. So if you actually want to go in and debug why your program isn't working or why your exploit isn't working, you have to run this command to disable basically the setconf. Because otherwise, you can't use ptrace to debug any program in your Docker mm. container. It's incredibly annoying. This took me all of last week to figure out. Um, so, uh, Will thinks he solved this, so let's have him walk us through what he found. So, I'm in Hopper looking at the binary. Yeah, what so, uh, well, this is, this is a little different. You have to go to the dot text portion because there is no main function per se. Uh, it's all just a bunch of jump calls to each other. Uh, and so, really, well, the way I found out, it's uh, I originally ran an S trace to figure out how it was getting our input, and it uses a read to get input. Okay. Uh, so I just went and uh, went ahead and looked for the actual read call in uh, the binary. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that it calls read, I think at hex 0804. It should 8, be 8416, eight, yep. That's the, that's the actual read call where it gets our input. Uh, and so the next thing that I did just to, to check when you want to see you have a buffer overflow is you just give it a lot of input and see what happens. See what happens, all right. What, why, do you want to go through the? No, or you could look at this for five seconds. So you can see okay. here that this is the call to read and we can see the hopper here. Let's see if I can Oh, well, I, I see what you're saying, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, it gives it, uh, yeah, you could look at the, yeah, yeah, no, you could look at the assembly, because read has three parameters, which is yes. the file descriptor, the buffer, and yes. then file how many descriptor. bytes you want to read in. Exactly, and so Hopper's yeah. nice, because it automatically kind of parses this out. Yeah. So it shows it that var, so zero is getting put onto var, onto the stack, mm -hmm. so zero is the file descriptor, so we know we're reading from what? Oh, uh, STD in. Standard in. And then the buffer then is going to be whatever was in EAX onto here, and what is here? A load effective address from EVP plus var 88. And then we can see here that it's actually EVP minus 136. So then we know that that's where our buffer is located. So we know that that's, so from EVP to our buffer is 136 bytes. And if we just look at the next argument, we can see, how much is this? That a hundred, which is five twelve. What? I can't see very well. Oh, two fifty six. I was, I was. Where's your hex skills? It was. They deteriorated. Okay. No, because it's easy. Because FF is two fifty five. Yeah. Right. So one zero zero two fifty six. Anyway, so we know that we're copying at most two hundred fifty six bytes just by looking at this, right? 256 bytes onto a buffer that's only 136. Well, the buffer itself is probably less than 136, but it know, we know it's 136 bytes up until EVP. Yes. And so we know after that is EVP, and then say VIP, and then we have whatever 130, 140 bytes minus 256 bytes to put extra on top of that. Mm -hmm. You can also see in the S trace that the read reads in 256 bytes. Cool. You could also do that. But as I showed, to actually test that, well, you could download it on your local machine, and that would actually work. Or if you run this command in a different container, Let's see what does work. No, it gives you because you're already uh, using the port. Yeah, 
guess. But I, I think if you change the port, it'll be fine. Yeah, I actually, for this, you're right. I don't need any port binding. Uh, so I can do. So I just type in something. So I can see that it called three, mm -hmm. which is what you're saying. And we pass it two to six. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we know that our but that we have a buffer overflow uh, that we can execute. So now we what need to what? What would be the first thing that we do? Well, to test to see if we can actually execute it. Yeah. yeah. So how do we do that? Uh, well, so we know that on the stack. So there's 136 bytes between uh, the start of the buffer and uh, EBP. So we need four more bytes to overflow EBP because we don't care about EBP and then four more bytes to overflow EIP. So it's 140 uh, to overflow uh, everything up until EIP, and then yeah. So I think, I don't know if it'll tell you doing it like this, but if you do it in GDB, it should just tell you that you get a uh, seg fault at, uh, I think 63, 63, 63 is lowercase c, yeah. So we can do this. We can I know there's a way, but I think the easiest way is probably just to pipe it to a file outside of GDB. Yeah. Oops. Or, uh... <laughs> Some nice music taste there. Uh, just R. You don't need to change. Well, I didn't write GDB challenge. Oh. Uh, 63 is what character? Lowercase c. What's lowercase a? 61. Yes. What's uppercase a? 41. Yes. All right. Useless trivia out of the way. It's not useless. You can use it. That's okay. hex? That's hex? Hex, is yeah, hex 61. ASCII. Okay, cool. So now we did that. Now what? So now we want to figure out how or what we want to do, mm -hmm. right? So we have a buffer overflow that we can execute. So what do we want to do with that? What's our what's our goal in this binary? Generally, we want to get a shell of some sort, right? Yeah. Well, we want to we want to get a shell. We want to get into their system. Uh, in this case, we want to retrieve the flag file. At the least, we want to get the flag, right? Yeah. In this yeah. case, we know exactly that we want to steal the flag. We actually don't care. I mean, executing a shell is usually the easiest, and it gives us the opportunity to do other things if we wanted to. But at the bare minimum, because that's another thing you got to think about, right? Is maybe they restrict running a shell or they restrict other things. But if you can still read that flag, that's the key that you want to do, right? So, objective. Exactly. You always got to keep in mind what's your objective that you're trying to do. The shell actually allows you to do more things, right? But if you can't do the shell, maybe you can still do what you want to do of reading that flag. So now that we know that we want to get a shell, yes. what's what's the very base level of how you, let's say you were writing a C program, how would you get a shell? Right, you could use the uh, system call. And system takes one parameter. Do you guys know what that parameter is? Is it a zero or a one? No, the for system it's a uh, pointer to the location of oh, the bash. file that you want to read it. In this case, bin bash, bin bash. or bin bin sh. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Another important thing: system is in the is in libc, so it's not a system call. Yeah. So our goal is to basically call system, which is a library call, bin sh like mm -hmm. this. Exactly. So. What, what's, what are some interesting things about this program that we know from just running a file on it? It's dynamically linked. It's dynamically linked. 32-bit. 32-bit, that's, no. 32 32. that's the first thing, right? Mm -hmm. So 32-bit program, so we need to know that, so we shell code, everything is good. It's also dynamically linked. So- How do you know that? 
if we were to run, let's say, Rock Gadget, oh, there's okay. and I say I want to do the Rock Gadget to generate a Rock Chain, it's going to say it actually can't find any gadget. It can't find a right what where gadget. Mm -hmm. So this means that there's not enough gadgets in this code to just throw it into Rock Gadget and have Rock Gadget throw you back a huge payload to put in that would just work automatically to call. And usually exec in SH is what Rock Gadget tries to do. Mm -hmm. So we need to be more clever and do it our own way. So what's the goal? So we want to call system somehow. So what? Well, where does system live? Yeah, that's system is in libc, but system because the library is dynamically linked we actually don't have a hard address for system yes and another key is that they actually provided a hint to us because they gave us the copy of libc so they gave us the libc version the exact libc version that they're actually using which means they think at least that we should use this information right so if we were able to just throw rock gadget at it and just get a payload there's no reason we need the libc version and so be like, why the heck are they giving this to us? Mm -hmm. um, but they are giving us the libc, which probably means we need to use that. So if we look, let's see. We can just look in case we've never done it before. Uh, refile. Yes. If they didn't, what happens then? If they didn't give us the version of libc? Gotta do everything by hand. <laughs> uh, it'd be much more uh, difficult, but you could probably. You yeah, yeah, you'll see why we need their libc, but there are tools online where you could actually, uh, I, I saw something which was really interesting, which uh, I'll, it'll give away the solution right yeah. now, but yeah. yeah. Let's, let's wait then. Um, so you can see there's all the program, all of the possible functions in libc are all in here. So things like read. How'd you get that? I just loaded it in the hopper libc.so, it was in, it was down, provided by the organizers. Hopper's free, right? That's a free thing? Uh, yes, it has free, limited time or something. You can't say it for, okay. it's also $100. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not I mean, that's, that's a lot, you know. It's, it's, it's a lot, lot but a not, not as far as these disassembly exactly. programs go. So interesting, idea. so we have read here, you know, this is what actually, so we gotta remember when the program loads, Right, the dynamic linker, when it sees a call to a libc function, will find this libc on the system, load it into memory. But the important thing is remembering, I'm not gonna be able to scroll that wrong, uh, that it gets loaded at a, you know, at a different offset. So the offsets in here, like this library can be loaded dynamically into any different memory region. So even though we know from looking at ROP and everything in the past that the program's code is always loaded at fixed memory addresses, right? So we saw, that's what uh, Will was talking about, that's um, that ROP source Rex has fixed memory me fixed memory locations, right? So this, this J read is happening at 08048416, right? Doesn't change at all. This is always where this code's going to be. But libc is always going to be at a different location. Mm -hmm. How do you know that that one's always fixed? Uh, Generally, if you can see it in the object dump, yes. uh, then it's not going to move. Uh, or the disassembly, whatever program you use to disassemble it, that uh, address is not yeah, going to move. You can use, let's see, did I run this? I think, will PIE uh, move that actually, or no? I honestly don't remember. Uh, luckily, there's a nice check sec program which you can run to say that this program does not have a canary. This is another thing we didn't do, right? This program doesn't have a canary. It does have NX, and what does that mean, Will? Uh, that's a good question. The non-X... Executable what? Stack? Stack. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the stack itself is not executable. This is what tells us we can't just use a buffer overflow on the stack to put our shellcode on the stack and jump to our shellcode because we cannot execute anything on the stack. Uh, yeah, the PIE and... I actually don't remember exactly what all these things do. One of them will make the process, well, I still think the code itself is usually not completely relocatable, but mm -hmm. I don't remember. This NX is set for every segment in memory, just like that, right? Correct. 
Correct. Yes, exactly. So every segment is, uh, the other way to think about it is write, XOR, execute, right? So you can, e each segment of memory is either writable or it's executable. No segment is both. And that's a core security mechanism. But we know that we can still get around that. So how are we going to get around that? Uh, so what we so so we have to break down kind of what we have to do, right? We want to call system within SH. So, yes. so this is so if we look at let me go to uh, so our goal state we want to get into right. Yep. This is what we want to get to. Right. So how are we gonna get there? So there's two things that we need to really get there. One is we need to put the string bin sh into memory because the actual system call asks for a pointer to the location, uh, not just the uh, string. And the second thing we need is we actually need the address of system so that we can call it. If only there was a handy address of operator that we could use. <laughs> Uh, right. So exactly. So we need to we need to find the address of system, and we need bin sh somewhere in memory. Mm -hmm. right. So how so system isn't located in our program's object dump anywhere. Uh, right. We need no call to system here. Otherwise, it would be much easier, right? We yeah. Just kind of jump because. Right with the ROP and overflowing the stack, now we can control all the function frames on the stack, and so maybe we could make it look different or change the um, stack to call into system. And it would mm -hmm. be so much easier because we know when we make the payload of what we want to be written on the stack and the overflow, we know exactly what we wanted things to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need some way to find the address of system, and it's not anywhere in our program, but we do have other libc functions in our program, like read and write, right? Because we use read to read out the input, and if you looked, it uses write to write out win at the end. So we know we have the address for those two. Uh, and we can actually use those to find the address of system. Uh, we have to, uh, to do it locally, you'd use GDB, but uh, because we're executing this on their machine, and they gave us that uh, their libc, we can actually use their libc to find a offset between read and system. Yeah. Because we know in the global offset table, right, at, we know that exactly at 0804. Well, do, do you guys know what the global offset table is? I think so. Yeah. I don't. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, so the global offset table basically, so you have a uh, uh, local. Wait, wait, let's, oh, yeah, yeah. wait, let's step through. I think that actually made it easier. So we go here, we can actually just step through and see, okay, this is the read call that we had. We know it's, and we know, we look if we look at the man page, it's like man, man to read. Uh, da, da, da. I don't know why this is taking so long. <laughs> so we know first that it's a libc function. So this is good. It's calling a libc. It's read, file descriptor, the pointer to the buffer, and the number of bytes, which is exactly what we thought. So if we look here, we think, oh, this calls into the libc library, right? Because that's what we're doing. We're calling the libc function. If we look here, it's actually doing, is it's going to what, what uh, Hopper is calling j underscore read. And we can see here what it's doing is jumping to whatever is at memory location read at GOT. So this is a basically an indirect jump. It says whatever is, and read at GOT specifically is 080496.1c. So the idea is, and this is how um, dynamic linking works. So instead of libc being com compiled into our binary and included as part of our binary, instead of that happening, libc is loaded at runtime somewhere in memory, and the dynamic linker says, I know if I put here at exactly at 080496.1c, if I put the address of the read function here, those four bytes, that's where it will jump to whenever we call read. 
So this is how that you get that dynamic linking component, which is great because now if there's a vulnerability in libc, instead of having to recompile your app and redistribute to it to everyone, you can just update your libc version on your system, and now new applications will use that new libc version. So we know basically what Will is saying, we know at runtime at 08049614 will be the address of write in libc, and at 08049614c will be the address of read. So we actually have in memory there will be two locations into libc. The read and the write? Yes. So how does that help us? Yeah. So okay, so now that we know that we can get an address for read and write, right? We need to find some way to get to system. Uh, so you can either do that uh, again locally through GDB on your thing, or use their libc that they provided, and uh, literally subtract the uh, address of where read is in their libc from the address of where system is in their libc. And do you want me to save you some time by just telling you what the? Uh, yeah, well, let's let's look through here because we can see we have libc here. We actually already know where read is. We know that in the program, read is at offset D5980. So in this libc, address of read is at offset 0x D5980. While system is here. Is at offset zero x three a d a zero. So basically, and actually the way I did it a weird way because I always found that I ended up mixing up. Do I get the address of read and then subtract or add from it? So I'd always have to test. So when I was doing this last time, I figured out oh I should just get the address of read. So let's say I get x. So like let's say x is the address of read on the system. System is the right word. But if I have x, then I subtract this offset. Now I know I'm at basically the first zeroth byte of libc. And then I know if I take that and I add this offset to it, sorry, this problems, then this is the address of system. I take whatever read is, I subtract D5980, and of course you could simplify this very easily, but uh, writing it like this actually makes a lot more sense to me. Um, so D5980 is just a number? It's a number based on inside libc. Okay. It's based on the offset of read in libc. So it may be different for different operating systems for different versions of libc. This is why they provide you exactly, this is the libc version. So that's why you need to use the D5 time here. Yes, and this one too. So you subtract that, and you add the other one, and then you get to the right location. Then we know the address of system. So how do we get the address of the read? Yeah, so we don't know what the address of read is, right? We know where the pointer to the address of read is, but we don't know what the address of read is. Uh, and this is where, uh, this is, the first part is actually just your uh, basic buffer overflow, in a sense, right? So, because we want to... Just what we did before, right? It's basically going to be, yeah. like, the payload is going to be A times 136 to get us mm -hmm. to the A's, um, plus B times 4. This gets us to EDP. Mm -hmm. Now we're at EIP. So mm -hmm. now the next four bytes we go to is going to be the next address that gets executed. So the, we actually have a function that'll let us print stuff out to the console. We have write in our program. So we can actually write out, and write takes three parameters, which is a file descriptor, a buffer to read from, and how many bytes you want to read out. And so we can give write uh, the file descriptor for a CD out. We can give write uh, the buffer, which is the pointer to the address of read, right? And that'll then read out uh, uh, what that address is to the console for us. So and the goal is to get the system basically bin SH, right? 
right? So what Will's saying is what we really want to do is write out to Cloud Scripture zero, which is standard out. We want to uh, write out. Is it one? I'm pretty sure. Yes, you're right. See, that was a test. <laughs> uh, we want to write out. What do we want to leak? Read. Read. Yeah. Zero uh, x. 08, 04, 96, 1C. And how many bytes do you want to write out? Four. Four bytes. Because we're leaking an address. Exactly. So this is going to leak four bytes and send it back to us from the other side. So essentially, this is the first function we want to execute. And then what do we want to do after that? So now we have the address of read. So to get the address of system, we just have to apply our offset that we found. Right. right, so then we essentially, so let's say calculate address of system based on above. So now we have the, uh, now we have where system's located, so we need to put binsh into memory and then uh, call system, right? So we probably want to put, we need to put binsh in first before we call system. Uh, and so we can use read to do that as well, right? So I want to read from what? Uh, you want to read from standard in, which is zero, uh, to. Do I just put any random address here? What if I do like forty one four? No, it needs to be a valid uh, address that you can reach. Uh, that you can write. Write to, yes, yes, yeah, that you can write to. So how do you find that? Uh, you can use the read elf. I think dash e will give you what you want. Uh, dash oh dash g. I don't know. Wait, what did you say? E. Yeah. Uh, I scroll up a little bit. There you go. Cool. Uh, so this gives us all the segments in the binary. We're looking for something that's writable. Yeah. W. W's are important. And so you can pick anything. So we're going to write bin sh, uh, but also the string, we have to null terminate the string, right? Because if we don't and we start writing into some other segment, it's just going to, it's when we uh, go to finally call system and point it to the buffer, it's just going to continue to read everything that we have after that. So we need to write uh, bin, bin sh, which is seven bytes, and then one null byte. So we need something that's at least eight bytes in size. So we don't want to use, let's say, this jcr for whatever that is, that's four. We don't want to use detours or ctors, because those are eight. So we either want to use, which one did you use? Uh, I used dot data, I think. BSS? Uh, that's we, only eight, too. Um, the dot dynamic, I'm pretty sure. Dot dynamic, okay. Yeah, cool. scroll up a little bit, I think. Oh, no, it's right there, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So we want to read in from standard in into this memory location eight bytes. So this, so that means on our side, we're going to have to send, we'll first read in four bytes, that's this address of read. We'll then send eight bytes, which will be slash bin slash sh null character. Then what do we want? Yeah, so now we want to call system, but our problem is is that we don't actually have a way to call it right now, right? We don't have any system anywhere in our program. So what we need to do is we need to put system in our program. And the easiest way to do that is overwrite the address that we found of system with some other function. Uh, or the, the uh, we need to, sorry, we need to overwrite some other function with the address we found of system. Uh, so we, you can really choose any address that uh, you, you want to execute. execute. Yeah, I learned that you can actually save a line, Adam, if you just overwrite exit, then you don't need to call at the end. I don't think. Mm, no, you still need the. You still need the. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but so for this, because we already know what the address of read is, and we're lazy and don't want to type it out again, uh, we're gonna use the. We're gonna use the address of read. So we're gonna overwrite uh, the address of read with our address of uh, system. Uh, four. Exactly. So here, this is going to overwrite the address that was at 080496.1c, which is in the global offset table right here, 1c. So those four bytes will now, instead of pointing to, instead of having the address of the read function at libc, we'll change that to point to the system function. Can you print that out and see it as it happens? Uh, Maybe just write out uh, like what you're reading well, into. Yeah, we'll look yeah. at the actual code in a second. Yeah. Uh, wait, what do you mean? Uh, like under that first read, just put like bin sh, and then the second one, uh, just address of system. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's what we're we're reading into. And then we're calling system, but really we're calling read. Right, we're calling the uh, wherever this is. So we actually want to go here to J underscore read. So that's actually really what we want to do. I mean, this is how it looks in Hopper. That's the name it gets at. But we want to go to this J underscore read function and pass it slash bin slash essay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, that's just uh, what we want to do. Yeah, it's a regular. So you would call read again with the same address you've been calling read with previously, yes. uh, except in this time, instead of giving it three parameters, you're only going to give it one, which is the address of dot dynamic, which we use to write in the uh, bin sh. Yes, or we so we'd actually call that read with this. Yeah. So should we look at your answer? Sure. Drop a break. Yeah. This is, uh, I, I somehow messed up, uh, well, yeah, my, I had one that was like commented, but I messed up something and I didn't, it wasn't working. So I pulled an old version down that I had, was doing with Vue. Uh, but so anyways, yeah. So I did, I was trying to see where stuff was in memory. So I just did A, B, C, D, E to see how it was uh, recycling. Why, uh, why not? But, oh, no, no, I know why. Uh, because it divides evenly into 140. I mean, I know that. I know yeah. that's why it works, but I... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I, I was doing four bytes, and I was like, this isn't going to divide evenly for me. So I did five bytes. Okay, uh, okay so you can see uh, I have two offsets up there when I commented out. The first one's the offset on... I had a lot of trouble because I used the offset of libc in my system, and I had a different version of libc. Uh, so I had to use the libc version that was provided to find the correct offset. Interestingly, Vu's libc was the same as your libc, so he didn't need to change the offset. Uh, and so I have up there, uh, I know it's kind of poorly laid out, but the uh, address of write, the address of read. Uh, so have, remember, it's in little endian, mm -hmm. because somebody doesn't know how to use the pack functions yet. 080483 oh, oc, 080483 oh, 2c, and that's actually, that's not the pointer to read. That's the, or that's the pointer to, that's like the read at PLT. Oh, this is yeah, the, yeah, yeah. This is the uh, J underscore read. Yeah. Okay, cool. So those are the calls into read and write. Yeah. OK, what's this pop rock? So, oh yeah, we didn't really explain that, did we? Uh, so the pop, so this is the reason why this is a ROP uh, exploit, right? Is because the purpose of a ROP is we want to use uh, what are called ROP gadgets, instructions that are already in our binary to uh, do some things for us. Uh, so, for yeah. instance, let's say, so basically, oh man, I'm going to have to. You're just going to just going to find a slight. Oh, OK, OK. No, no, no. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. So, just because it's a little bit easier. No hard feet. So no, no, see, no. You can see the layout exactly. So if we just focus on, let's say, this part here. So we see we have 136 A's, then we have four B's. So the 136 A's gets us up to EVP. The four B's overwrite save EVP. The next thing is where we're going to go. And this is 080483.0 C. So if we look at Hopper, we That's see. That's what you're injecting, that when address. Or the wait. stack, so we're overwriting yeah. the stack. Yeah, I'm where we're stuff. overwriting is the saved EIP. So this is when this function is done executing, control the return instruction will go and start executing from 080483OC. And that's a function call basically to the write function. Now the question is, this is actually what I messed up a lot because I didn't draw the diagram out while I was doing this. What the thing that's above the address, of, so our three parameters are the file descriptor, which was one, which is exactly what we have on our scratch here. Uh, maybe I should pull that. Uh, on our scratch. So we want to call write. So we're calling into the write, j write. We're passing in one. We're passing in, I used write, so 
0804-96-14, which is right at, in the address of the GOT, and then we want four bytes. So this is what the stack looks like. Now, the question is, when write is done executing, so when I call this function, it's gonna go jump to the save DIP onto the stack, and where that save DIP is located is right here in between the function I was going to and the next three parameters. And to really get this, you have to draw out the stack and look at exactly what happens as soon as you start executing that new function. I had a problem where I had too many things on the stack there, I didn't have those in the right place. But fundamentally, when we get here, ideally we want to then call read zero this other gadget, right? So we've written out correctly. But the problem is, is the stack, the next things on our stack are our three arguments that we just had to the right function. So the trick is using finding a pop gadget, basically. So if we look and we run ROP gadget on here, so this is, even if you can't make a chain, it'll show you all the different gadgets. So we basically need a gadget that does pops. We want, and how many pops do we want? Three. Why? Uh, because that's how many parameters that we put on the stack. We wanna go pop, 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 so that, that way the next address that we go execute at is whatever next thing I want. Or if I widen this, we can see that it's now a, the read function is where I want to go to because we want to call read zero blah, 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 blah. So we look for a gadget that does three pops followed by a return, and there's actually a lot of those. Pop PDF, CSI. Was what? PDI. Uh, yeah, so here, no. was it this one? No, that's a four pop. Oh, that's four, yeah, you're right. Oh, uh, yeah, a couple below that, yeah. 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 0804-84-D6, there's a pop, 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 return. So each of those pops will change the stack pointer until right before that return, this is the address that's on the stack. So this is where we will go start executing it. And then I think now we can go back to Because yours is going to be the same. So you have the right instruction, the pop rock, which is 0804-84-6-B6, uh, B6, which is the same thing. And so you have the right address, we're gonna call right, afterwards we're gonna pop three times, and then we have a file descriptor of one, uh, read global offset table 0804-96-1-C, and byte number of 0004. So we have a file descriptor, read that. And the next thing we're gonna do is then call into... That's actually the BSS address, uh, which actually worked, uh, but you can use the dot dynamic as well. Wait, but where's, you're gonna pop three times, right? Pop, yes. Pop, pop. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh because Yeah, that's not part of the payload. Pass. That's not part of the payload. <laughs> I was, I was just writing code, okay? This is, and this is how it turned okay, out. So this is much better. So in the future, to structure it, it's better if you kind of have each of the chunks by themselves. I mean, it's fine to use the names. Like, you can see I didn't really do a good job of using the names. I just used constant values, and then I messed up a few times where I put different values in different places, which is not good. Um, see, I was doing it as I went, and then I realized I needed those parts, so then I just added them in as I was. Uh, understandable. Oh. I'm just saying, having these in here kind of ruins the flow of, like, here's my payload chunk, and then here's my payload. So. When I kind of got a route chain, I want to just see the entire payload laid out like that. So maybe a good strategy would be to put all those constant values like Yeah, yeah, just up at the top, yeah. yeah that, that's good. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. So we have a read address. We're going to have a triple pop again. And where are we going to read? We're going to read uh, from standard input. From yeah. zero, standard mm -hmm. input. We're going to read into the BSS address, which is this 0804.96.28. And we're going to read in eight bytes. And then after that, so this is going to happen. We're going to pop three times. We're going to pop, pop, pop. Go to here. Go to the read address. We're going to then go triple pop again. Read from standard input into the GOT four bytes, which I believe should be Yeah, that's byte. Right. Yeah. Um, pop, rock will execute. We'll go pop off three times. 
And now we're finally going to write. Uh, this is actually, I did this because I was messing ah. up a couple times. Debug. Yeah. Yes, this is yeah. good. This is debug output. So what Will's doing is writing out so everyone can see. So he's calling the write function because he hasn't overwritten the write function. He's only overwritten read. So he's calling write. He's doing a triple pop. And then he's passing in. Uh, That's uh, standard out. Standard mm -hmm. out. He's passing in the read GOT. And then he's passing in four bytes. Uh, four here. Yeah. You should use byte now. I sh yeah, but I didn't. <laughs> I can see that. Thank you. Uh, so what's your rationale? Why did you do this? Yeah. So this doesn't actually affect the ROP chain at all because we're just popping everything off the stack. Uh, but what I was doing is I was having some problem because uh, I wasn't getting a shell a couple times. So what I did is I wrote out the address that was at the uh, read GOT, that, which I had thought I had previously written into read GOT. So I was using that write to write out to compare if the two addresses uh, of system that I had were the same. Right? Uh, but, and that's just, that's like one, like I also did it for the BSS segment to see if bin sh was written to the correct place as well. Uh, and so you can just use uh, uh, write and your rock gadgets to debug internally. Yeah. That's a good little trick. And then after that, we call read function. But at this point, our read has been overwritten. It should be pointing now to system. We have some junk because we don't really care. This should never execute. And then we have, we pass in the argument of the VSS addresses where we put in slash bin slash sh. And then send the payload. So then are you done? Uh, no, you have a couple more things. So after you send the, well, so we wrote in there, right? We're reading in from standard in. So it's expecting us to give some input to it, right? So we can't just send the payload and uh, uh, get a shell. We need, to, we need to do a couple more things. Yes, so you gotta think of, remember this is an interactive shell, right? Because, or this is an interactive exploit because essentially we're leaking those four bytes of this is the pointer to read. And so our code, our exploit code has to read those four bytes, sorry, read that, yeah, four bytes, read that address in do the calculation to figure out where the address of system is in this specific execution, then write that back out so that when it, or we have to first write out uh, slash bin slash sh zero, because that's what it's expecting here. Then the next four bytes that it's expecting are the address of system that it's gonna write in. So the, when this rock chain executes, sorry, uh, when this rock chain executes, it's actually going to, when it hits the read, it will wait basically for our input. So that's how we're gonna do it, so. And so this next section, I was very tired and don't judge me. Uh, oh good, it's Adam's code instead. So we send, so we use, we send the payload and you can see here, I also added debugging stuff because I, my payloads were, I think kind of funky. So I printed out the representation of P so I could see all the bytes. Um, anyway, so we send the payload but now we know we need to receive specifically four bytes from the payload because the first thing it's gonna do is leak that pointer, right? So it's gonna output four bytes, therefore I can just say, I wanna receive, it took me a while to look up in Pwn Tools that they have this receive end function which waits specifically for four bytes. Um, this is also why I wanna show this to you because okay. this can simplify your life too. Um, so I know that I've now gotten four bytes from remote I turn that using the U32 function in phone tools. So this turns it from the string into an integer, 32-bit integer, into the address of write. And I do exactly what I was doing before, right? I do that, and then I subtract the offset of the write function, which is that DF9F0, which is the baseline, and I add 3ADA0. Pretty close to Adam. Uh, to the baseline, you get me to the address of system. Then in my code, I first sent the address of system, and then I send the bin sh null, and then I get an interactive shell. Uh, Will does this in a different way. I was too lazy to look up how to turn bytes around, so I just did it manually, and I didn't even do it the good way, and I thought, I, I used a for loop. I'm not proud, but it works. Hey, sometimes you just have to do it, it works, but the nice part in here is learning better ways to do exactly. things. So uh, I'm gonna run Python, I'm gonna run Devil, CTF, solutions, drop source, drop, drop, break. So now we have a repeatable 
exploit that'll work. Uh, if the libc version changes, then we're going to have problems because our offset is going to be different. But at least here now we have a repeatable exploit against this specific version. Questions? It's a pain to get 100% right. That's yeah. There's a lot of little details. That's why these debugging tricks of writing out whatever you wrote in, these kind of things can really help. And I guess just to prove mine also works. Oh, we got root shell. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's uh, rm-rf, please. Sad. Can you even exit? Will it allow you to exit?